Recently I've been working on this form here. This one is bone dry and this is the design proof that I 3D printed. So this will be the final fired size. You can see it has a fair bit to shrink. And I want to add a handle to this to make it into a mug. I have a bunch of different handle forms and a variety of sizes, basically these two. So this one is a D shape and this one's more of an ear shape. Let's see if we know those will work. So since this is the final size, we can kind of get a sense of what it would look like. No, it's too big. That one might be okay. Here's the ear handle. I think it works well for this one that's taller. Another example. I think that's also pretty good. And then I have a bunch of the D-shaped handle as well. For this giant mug, it works really well. I have a tiny one here. And then this one too. While I like these handles, I think I want a different one for this form. And I came up with this. So this is a nice petite handle, more of a C-shape, kind of curves out. I think it would look well on this mug. Hi, I'm Kent. Let's make a new mold for this handle. I have some software that lets you take a profile of the handle, both the outer profile as well as the cross-section profile. That's how I made these as well. And you'll notice that all the cross-sections are slightly different. This one, this one's a little bit more squared off to match kind of the more square style. This one's slightly more curved. And this one's very thin and rounded over. So I think it'd be very delicate. Right now that software is very much a prototype, so pretty much only I can use it. Maybe one day I'll integrate it into the Shapecast website. But if you're interested in the meantime, feel free to reach out and maybe I can work with you to get a handle that you want. There's a variety of ways to make this. So if you wanted to do the traditional way, you basically would need, first need to account for clay shrinkage. You can see the difference in sizes between bone dry here and this will be basically what the final fired pot is. The mold for this is even bigger since it's already shrunk going to bone dry. So if I want a final handle like this, I need to get something larger. And that would look something like this. This one's accounting for my clay shrinkage, which is 13%. So it has been scaled up. So you can see how much bigger it is. And basically in all directions. So if you want to do this traditional way, you could go ahead and somehow make the positive of your handle scaled up. And then you want to add some sort of attachments to the end. So these are sprues. And we're going for something like this. Basically we'll want two halves. There'll be a place to pour slip into for both ends and these two halves meet together. Or we'll band it together, pour in the slip. Once it's hardened, we can demold it. And then we'll trim off the excess on the ends, cut it, and then attach it to our pot. So we want something similar for this. So again, doing it the traditional way, you can somehow carve this. You want to make sure there's no undercut so it doesn't get stuck. And then how you would often do this is you'd build walls around this and then put clay or something in the bottom up to the halfway mark. These are from a different mold, but give you the idea. So you'd make some, some walls and you put down a bed of clay and you would have this embedded basically to the halfway part until the midpoint line. That would be clay. You would then fill the rest of it up with plaster. You would then let the plaster cure and then take it apart. You would flip it over. So now the plaster's on the bottom and the clay's on the top. You'd remove all the clay and then you'd fill up the rest of the way with plaster. Between those layers, you'd put mold soap so the plaster doesn't stick to itself and then you'd have the two parts. So a shape cast, we actually pour both halves separately. So I actually just tape this together for demonstration purposes. It's actually two pieces. And the advantage of doing it this way is that we don't need the clay underneath. We can basically pour against a flat surface. We can then assemble a wall around it. Like this, and we can pour plaster in. Of course, we don't want to do that against the bench. So I have a bottom plate here. And this one has a bunch of specific features that are modeled in. So it actually captures this piece here. So I slightly extended it so it fits down into this bottom plate very snugly. And you can tape it together so it doesn't leak. And then we have the outer walls, which fit on just like that. Then we'll mix up plaster and pour it in. This mold is actually symmetric, so it's the same top to bottom. So we could actually go ahead and reuse this twice. However, since the slow part for me is waiting for the plaster to dry and I can go ahead and print a second one, I did just that. So here's another copy. Just like that. So now I can mix up one batch of plaster, pour both of these at the same time. You could demold it, clean off the mold and pour them back to back if you wanted to. That would mean mixing up two batches of plaster though. That will then give us a new handle mold. All right, off camera, I'll go ahead and prep these so that they're ready for plaster. Basically all that means is taping things together. You don't need to put anything on the surface. 
They're basically good to use straight out of the 3D printer. I printed these on the fine setting, so they took a while to print, but there's very few printed artifacts in them. If you wanted to, you could clean it up a little bit. This part here where we poured the slip in is gonna be cut off, so that really doesn't matter. Everything here also doesn't matter because it's the outside of the mold. So this here is the only piece we really care about. As I mentioned, one of the changes for this mold is that it's much thinner, so I'm a little curious if we can get it out. I suspect we will, but we'll need to be nice and careful. Okay, I'll tape all this together now. So basically cut off a little bit of tape and put around into the recess and you basically want to hold the handle form as tight as possible to the bottom. That little groove there basically forms a little step for this to seat against, but the idea is that this is nice and snug so the plaster doesn't leak through. Then taped all around the edges and then taped the seam on the side. I did that for both of them. I just use the back of a brush to basically make sure all the tapes pressed down. Don't want any plaster leaking out. And this is special tape, so this is tuck tape. It's a particular brand. It's meant for sheathing, and the idea is that it's very sticky. It's actually kind of hard to work with, but it's also waterproof. So that means that it will form a nice bond to hold things together and the plaster won't leak through. They're probably similar tapes as well. If you do try this though, just regular tape won't work. All right, next up is to mix up plaster. The, for the handles I have up on the Shapecast website, I go ahead and compute that for you. For this one, since it's a prototype, I didn't do that. I just computed the volume length, width, height, multiplied together times two, and that gives me the volume of plaster that I need. I'm gonna go ahead and mix up some plaster. I'm actually gonna do a couple pours at once, so this one and for another mold that I'm doing, so I'm gonna mix up way more plaster than I need. That'll actually make it easier. It's hard to mix small amounts of plaster without introducing bubbles. Kind of counterintuitively, the larger the volume you have, the easier it is, and that's so you don't suck down air into the plaster as you're mixing it. So we go ahead and mix up the plaster, and then we'll pour these molds. All right, I have my plaster all mixed up. This is, as I mentioned, a bigger batch than I need. So let's go ahead and pour these. There we go. I'm gonna use this as a brush to get any bubbles out of, away from the handle in particular. All right, go ahead and let these cure. It's been about an hour, so the plaster is cured. I like to demold these in two parts. Basically, the plaster gets stronger as it dries, and so we want to make sure it gets as dry as possible before we demold the handle part, which is the most fragile part. So we can just pull the tape off. All right, there we go, there's all the tape. So to get these to demold, the bottom comes off. Just like that. Get nice flat faces, and then these slide outwards because they're rounded over to make the mold nice to handle. Clean up the mold a little bit while it's still pretty soft. This part I spilled a little bit. And then we got a little bit of leakage here. This is where we'll pour in the slip and we can just gently break this out. All right, I'm gonna let these set up for just a little bit longer, let the plaster get a little bit harder, and then we will demold the inner handle piece. Okay, it's been maybe another half an hour. Let's go ahead and see if we can pull out the 3D prints. The real open question here is basically this narrower profile and how hard or easy that is. I'm gonna be delicate since the plaster is still pretty soft at this point. You don't wanna chip it. I see some movement. I like to take a pair of pliers and gradually just and just gently grab onto the slip here. It's not very big, but there's enough to hold on to. Some people had suggested putting bosses on the inside, and this is one of the reasons I didn't want to do that. Is that when it gets really narrow like this, there just isn't any room for them. 
and you need the plastic to be able to flex just a little bit to pull it out. There we go. Got one tiny chip there. This one too. If you're worried about breaking your plaster mold, you can do other things, like you can use a heat gun and soften the print. That will, of course, destroy the print, but then you don't have to worry about your plaster so much. So there are options there as well. But I think we got this one. I have not had to do that to any of my molds. Here we go. And there are two halves. As I mentioned, you can do these one at a time, basically back to back, since this one's symmetric. Here are the molds up close. I think they came out very well. So now these will dry. The idea is that we can put them together, rubber band them up. Got these giant rubber bands here. I just pull over on themselves a few times. I've heard some people say that rubber banding it like this will actually let the mold pieces kind of move together and potentially minimize any warping against each other. I'm a little bit dubious of that, but I figured might as well doesn't hurt. So now these will sit and dry out, finish curing. That will take at least several days. We can then make our new handle. It's been well over a week now and the mold is dry. I've been busy playing with my ridges and grooves tests. More to that to come eventually. Software's going slow, so let's go ahead and finish up this pot. While you weren't looking, I went ahead and poured slip in. Basically just transferred some of my container and poured it in. And I filled up the pot mold too. Let's come back when it's time to demold both of these and then we can make a mug using this brand new handle. There's a pot and the handle. flash on this one. I'm guessing that's going to clean up all right. There we go. There's the handle. Sit down right there. There could be a few things causing the flash. One is that maybe I didn't get the parts exactly aligned together. That's one thing you want to double check. These mold keys or notches as they're known have a little bit of tolerance in them because of the 3D prints aren't exactly perfect. So you might need to move them around a little bit. The other possibility is the 3D print itself isn't perfectly flat. I'm mean, thinking about options for dealing with this and lapping it if you really want to have a good seam line. Let's go ahead and take off the sprues. So I just want to slice down here, take off the sprue itself. This one's a little front heavy. Because the handle's so delicate. These will go on the reclaim. Touch this up just a bit. Well, it's easy to get to. Still super soft, so be careful not to damage the handle itself. The outside, see if we can get to once it's on. So we're gonna to wanna to attach it something like that. However, to do so, we need to cut a curve into the handle so it matches the curve of the pot. But right here, you wanna cut a little bit of a curve, a little bit of a radius. Doesn't look like we're gonna need much. There we go. There's a tiny little gap. We can fill that with slip. So if you want to, you can score these before you slip them. However, since these were just slip cast, I don't think we need to. I've been doing just fine without it. However, this is a pretty delicate handle. So do whatever you feel is best for your practice. I'll just take a brush in my slip, a little bit of it. Nice, healthy coat on. And then decide where you want your handle, because it's going to live there. Think like that. Gently push it down. You don't want to deform the pot. It's still super soft. You could wait a little bit longer till things are closer to leather hard, and then you definitely would want to score. But I found attaching them basically right away 
but their slip cast at the same time has worked okay. And if there's any gap, what will happen is the slip should get sucked down between there, basically through capillary action. It's one of the things that's happening with the plaster as well. The plaster sucks the water out because it's got tiny little gaps inside of it. There we go. One attached handle. All right, I'm going to let this firm up a little bit more. I think I'll probably cover it overnight. That way all the water levels can homogenize and then we can go ahead and clean it up using a sponge. And in the meantime, I'm going to flip it back over so the foot can dry. All right, this has sat overnight and it has firmed up quite a bit. Let's go ahead and clean it up. So let's start with a damp sponge. Just want to smooth things out. And have a smaller bit of sponge that is good for these connections here. I think the handle's good. Now we just need the rim of the pot here. Break the edges. It's not sharp. Now this will just sit and dry out. Once I have enough wear, I'll go ahead and bisque fire it and then glaze fire it. But it should look something like this when it's fired. And with that, I have another new design for handles. This isn't on the Shapecast webpage yet, but eventually I'll put it up there. I want to go ahead and expand the selection of handles that I have, and this is yet another test, making sure that the mold system actually works really well. And so far, so good. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. Thanks.